Hello. So that was an interesting talk about a very um, large subsystem. It affects the way that, um, that I came here. Um, now I'm going to talk about something that's very small on the opposite end of the scale. And we'll see how this, see if it's kind of a bit interesting to me at least. So I'll start off by first of all giving an introduction into OpenBSD and why this is um, a relevant thing. So OpenBSD is a bit different than what you, some of you will probably put it in the same sort of um, scope as Linux or something like that. And we don't, we inside OpenBSD don't actually see it that way. We um, consider ourselves a community of probably rather strange people who um, work on software um, specifically for the purpose of trying to make it better. Um, we take a whole systems approach, trying to change everything in the ecosystem um, that, that's under our control, trying to see if we can make it better. Um, we gain a lot of strength by being able to throw backwards compatibility out the window. So that means that we're able to do research, and the minute that we decide that something isn't right, we'll design an alternative for it and push it in, and if it ends up breaking everybody's machines from the previous stage to the next stage, that's fine because we'll end up in a happier place. So this is how we do this for ourselves. Somehow along the way, we, we tend to make a soft release every six months, somehow. So basically, if a programming interface is, is not quite right, what we will do is we will try to think of how it could be better if we were to start from scratch. We'll take that principle that we design and we'll push it through the entire subsystem, from the kernel all the way through user land. And we can't really push up into the applications like, like Firefox and everything, but some of the things that we do will influence the way the things work up over there. And, and, and if somewhere along the way we're wrong, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just rehash it because we don't care about binary compatibility and we're trying to see if we could just find a better path. So we, we try to make sure that the high-level requirements that we encounter out in the ecosystem influence low-level features. And at the same time, when a low-level feature is somehow difficult to do, we're willing to see if we can push it up and have it influence a subsystem by making its job easier so that that subsystem will then use more of that capability to get greater benefits. So that's a big spiel. But I'm just going to try to give a talk here about one specific small little feature called Art for Random, which has a story like this. So it was around 1996 when someone broke into OpenBSD's development infrastructure with a bug in syslogd. Before this, OpenBSD was just a place to work on support for PCs and Sparks and such like that. Security wasn't really a thing we were into. But suddenly we were interested. So we should probably thank whoever that person was. This started the comprehensive source code audit of everything in OpenBSD. And amongst all the many things that we found and fixed and such, randomization soon showed itself as being a very weak area. The first place that was really bothersome was in the Sun RPC code in libc. Oh, this is printed terribly, hasn't it? Sorry about that. Oh, it's, no, it's printed terribly. Um, the XID in the RPC messages was basically just um, the process ID and XORed with parts of the time. And then every single time a new RPC message was sent, it was incremented. And this is in libc, so it's very difficult to go and improve this. In FreeBSD, it's still broken to this day. Soon after this, we also realized that a similar scenario was happening off in uh, the DNS resolver, where the ID in every single packet was initialized at start to one or something like that. It was incremented on every single packet so that replay attacks and such were possible against DNS. So, here we have two scenarios. I would really like to use random numbers, but it's libc. And the state of the art at the time wasn't very good. So, what were we supposed to do? Were we supposed to open slash dev random every single time we wanted to send a DNS packet? I mean, that's just crazy, right? That's a huge resource. And we can't keep a file descriptor inside libc. You'll actually, if you search through libc, all sorts of various layers have this approach where they go and allocate file descriptors, use them, and then drop them 
because you don't want to have a file descriptor be retained as you exit back into the application and have it mess it up, accidentally free a file descriptor, put a new object in the same place, and chaos happens. Therefore, libc doesn't follow this policy. And what if there's no file descriptors available because you're at your resource limits? Now, all of a sudden, you can't send a DNS packet correctly, and you're failing at such a low level that you can't actually pass errors up to the library layers up above it in the applications to make them at least try to compensate or fail in a way that's debuggable. So what were we supposed to do? So we developed an API just for this particular area called Raz Random ID. It was 1997, first generation of it, and we kept on going. It took years and years with many developers involved to try to get this very refined, small little API to actually be very secure. Because it's supposed to be random, but not quite random. Because an example of a random number sequence is 12, 12, 12. And if you were to go and insert them into DNS packets, DNS packets don't have enough information in them for you to actually respond correctly and analyze the results you get. So you actually, the layer actually depends upon the IDB having some sorts of uniqueness aspects. It's part of the strength of the product. It's part of the strength of an extremely wimpy protocol. So even those parts of it aside, this function needed random numbers. And so the base realization is this. It's that the library and the kernel need random numbers that you can call and find at any place, down low, down high, anywhere you want. You should be able to go and get these numbers. And slash dev random is not a kick-ass API. You can't use that API because you don't have access to it in so many places, potentially. It makes your code more fragile. And the developer approach, therefore, because this API is so difficult to use, you have to have a large block of code to use it, they therefore just don't use it at all. So random numbers are not pushed into applications as they should be. Of course, there's this meme out there that you shouldn't invent your own crypto. You should use OpenSSL. Although I'd say that meme took a pretty big whack over the last six months. <laughs> so the problem is, people will keep telling you that you can't go invent a random number subsystem just on your own. Like, you're the OpenBSD project. What do you guys know about random numbers? You're theater at. You, what do you know? You can't go do this. And, but the same sort of message is given to everybody out there. And it discourages anybody from even trying to build a layer which will do the right thing. So 20 years of stagnancy where high availability random numbers don't actually end up at all the parts of the ecosystem where we need them to be. And the conversations always keep on shifting on all of these mailing lists. Everybody says, oh, but that subsystem's not going to be good enough for my, for, my, for my super secure keys. You have to make it so it's perfect for, the super, for, for those keys. And I don't care about the other application spaces. But all these use cases have to all be looked at so that we, it's the only way to do this is a comprehensive thing. So I want to see if you can just all imagine what if random numbers were as free as calling memset to clear memory. Let's see if we can get there. That's the holy grail. So as we're designing this, this is kind of a bit of a principle we sort of followed. This is why it has to be available everywhere, because you can't have applications going and making decisions as to which API they can use and what trick they should use on that API, for, in that API call to not trap itself and cause further harm like running out of file descriptors or something else. Or I'm in ch root, has the system gone and put a random node for me there? Can't have that. Or I'm deep, deep, deep down inside a library and there's some resource I can't go and get. So the software design decision that we made right off the, the, the bat was to make this thing descriptorless. So here, this is all we're aiming for, this right here. Anybody can call it anytime and we want them to use it. Somewhere around this, this time, of course, OpenSSH showed, showed up on the market. Somebody outside asked me about uh, 20 minutes ago, what year was OpenSSH? There's the answer, 1999. And in 2002, we added privilege separation to it, which meant that CH root utilization became much more common. So parts of the SSH implementation are running off inside a CH root jail and don't actually have things like slash, to ra slash dev random or other sorts of facilities like this. 
So all of a sudden, we've got a major daemon with significant security impact, which everybody's running. And it needs randomness like crazy. It needs key grade material. It needs IV grade. It needs, it needs a 32-bit random number whenever it needs it, just because it wants it. And we should be able to give it to it. And it's inside seed root space. It's really locked down and hard for, to guarantee access to this other sort of subsystem, class def random. In 2011, it went even further. See, what I'm trying to suggest here is that step by step, as art for random became more common, other applications like SSH would use it in new ways. And it, made, it forced us to make art for random even easier. And then that made OpenSSH use it more. And then that made us want to make art for random even more high available, including all the way to this entropy system call we've added recently. I'll get to that in a moment. I'm doing this kind of backwards. There's also the, uh, the stack protector, which you, all of you, of course, now know about the stack protector. It's on all of your phones. Um, the stack protector was developed uh, in OpenBSD. The actual story, a little bit more than that, is there was a Japanese researcher for IBM Japan who wrote a paper about it, and the paper was ignored. And then he wrote an implementation for GCC, and it was ignored. And then uh, we found it. And uh, we continued development of it in OpenBSD. And uh, within three, four months, had shipped a complete OpenBSD release with enabled on the kernel and user land and everything. So now it's on your phone. So that's a success. The stack protector uses a, th a random cookie, which it goes and pushes onto each stack frame. And in the original design, an application would, the, the, the C runtime, would go and take that cookie and put it on the first initial stack frame so it could be used on and on. And the kernel itself also had to initialize the cookie by itself. Now we've gone even further with the randomization by actually being able to initialize the cookie from the next layer up. So the kernel's cookie is actually initialized by the bootloader. And in an application, like, like uh, a standard program you run, you'll actually now discover that the cookie is initialized um, by the kernel itself. Uh, and if it's a shared library executable, you'll discover that there actually is a cookie in that main program, a separate cookie in the shared library linker, and a separate cookie in each shared library. So this is an innovation, which I think is actually going to show up on, on, on the Google phones uh, in about a year or two. Actually, large parts of this were written by them with us. So I th I'm pretty certain it's coming in to the Google phones. It's a, a quite nice mitigation strategy. So here's the history of arc for rand random. I start off with slash dev random because, of course, this is how it all started. We took the old code from Ted So because his Linux code, he actually made license so that we could actually use it as well. So it was imported into our tree in 1996. And then a bunch of us, sometime around August 96, became convinced this wasn't the right way, as I've mentioned earlier. And so this arc for random function in libc was born. It's just a small, tiny little stub which tries to not which initially opens slash dev random, but then you don't have to open it up after that. You just have random numbers. The history continues once it is art for random. We make it safe for siege root. We start feeding it via sysctl directly from the kernel, so we don't have to have a file descriptor. Uh, we try to solve problems with forking, new issues which keep coming, uh, issue which came up recently again. Uh, we were using RC4 for the actual cipher, and we got kind of we found some research papers that said we should initialize it a little bit better. Um, all sorts of developers you can see. Sort of about every couple of years, a whole bunch of, a couple of people work together and try to improve it. So the, in a nutshell, I'll now describe the API to you. It requires no setup in the system. It's, you don't have to initialize at the start of your program. You don't have to initialize the kernel. It's just there. If you're in the kernel, it's callable anytime except for an interrupt handler. But you basically can just call it and get the values you want. And away you go. In user land, you can call it even if you're running inside chroot. You can run it inside threads. You can run it inside any library anytime you want to. You can call on a signaler handler. You can run it when you're out of file descriptors. There's no reason not to call it. There's nothing else in the system that it actually collides with and creates a problem with. And you can see this also by the function definition. So basically, there's three variants. There's one that just returns a small value, a 32-bit value. 
There's one that fills a buffer full of random data. And there's one that, that we added on a little bit later on because we saw a lot of problems with modulus arithmetic. People didn't understand modulus arithmetic. And so we added the uniform distribution one so that people don't use modulus, like percent, some value, and then end up with biasing in the results. That's it. Those functions always return a result. They cannot return an error. They always return success. So now you can just go use them anywhere. So I'm going to talk now about the mechanisms underneath which have been built up as scaffolding to ensure that we can actually deliver this. Because having now told you that we've designed a layer which you can call no matter what and cannot fail, there has to be something underneath which makes this, uh, makes this possible. First, our contrarian viewpoint. We don't care what cipher, what cipher is used for the actual data compression at arc for random Because the minute we discover that the one we're using is wrong, we'll just replace it. Okay? End of problem. Forget about the cipher. It's not what's relevant. What matters is the pieces down below and how they're going to fit together and move the data up. So, uh, first I'll talk about the kernel. Uh, just just a, a, couple, a couple of words before I move on to some, some diagrams which try to demonstrate it. In our current design, the boot blocks actually load a seed off of the file system, and they pass it up to the kernel, and it lands directly inside the kernel's address space, already available as seeded information. The boot blocks also will try to use something else that the CPU has, if it's available at the, in the boot environment, to try to mix in and make that seed a little bit... I mean, it's a seed. A seed is not... The, the right type of thing for you to use for randomness. But you've got to start somewhere, because the hardware that we have doesn't actually have random number generators that you can trust. Now, I'm just going to skip this and go straight to the slides, because they're good diagrams. Okay, so here is the slide showing show what happens. So the root file system contains a seed file. The bootloader in green over there, uh, it goes and uh, loads the seed file, mixes it in with something like XOR or something. It can be very, very simple. With the seed, mixes it, and as it's loading the kernel into memory to place the kernel, there's an ELF segment. And it takes that entire ELF segment and it just fills it full of this random data, the seed material, just fills it in. And now your kernel starts running. And the minute the kernel's running, it has seed material. Now this seed material is good enough that it wanted to call arc for random, it could. It probably shouldn't. It should probably first do a bit of work at setting up some devices to try to mix some entropy in and make that seed material actually now get some other stuff in. Get that next. So the overview is what we're trying to do here is make the disk subsystem provide something to help the boot blocks help the kernel. And once the kernel actually collects more, from en more entropy from the system, it can then go and put a separate ARC4 generator in each program that, uh, that inside libc, inside every single user land program. And if we're to reboot, that's a fine opportunity at shutdown time for us to go and store a new seed for the next boot. So that your next boot will be fine. But what if you don't get your next boot? What if you crash hard or something? Well, an easy way to do that is, actually, let's just replace the seed also right at boot time. Because we've booted off of a seed, and we've already started doing some computations. By the time we get to the startup scripts of the system, that's already a good enough time for us to actually go and replace the old seed so that we don't have the next boot be exactly like the current boot. So the main subsystem in the kernel starts off with a, the engine is in the core of this with some feed that comes in from the side. So initially, when we boot, the boot blocks will have loaded the cha-cha state because we're using cha-cha for a cipher now. It'll have loaded the cha-cha state directly with, ran with the seed material. So that if a caller down at the bottom calls, uh, calls art for random right initially, too early, it still at least gets something. It's lockless. Meanwhile, anything entropically, which is, which is picked up at the top from a random gem generator part of the CPU, or um, we also look at uh, the delta between interrupts on different devices. Uh, we look a little bit at some of the packet headers. We throw some of that stuff in. That gets whitened and such, and then gets thrown to the cha-cha state once in a while. Off the bottom, you see there's all sorts of callers in the kernel which can go and take this data, rip it out, and use it for various functions. We follow a principle of something new, something old, or something old, something new. 
whenever we mix. So in, on the first initialization, we're using something old, which is what came from the boot blocks. That's the original seed. But we're also using something new as we start running, because that's when our entropy events start coming down, which we whiten. And that eventually becomes a replacement cha-cha st cha -cha state for pull down. And we reinitialize once in a while the same way. We consider the, old, the existing cha-cha state to be the old, because it's what we were just using, and we mix in the new with it. You might notice on these two diagrams, I actually haven't shown anything different. Because remember, I told you that the cha-cha state in the first thing is directly the seed material from the boot blocks. So these two diagrams are actually equivalent. Did everybody get that? <laughs> I think it's kind of funny. Um, we, we, we can also reinitialize from user land. Anytime user land, uh, uh, like root, decides that he wants to throw more seed material in there, go download a file, go fi find like an entropy file somewhere on the net, just anybody's junk, just throw it in, write it to slash dev random. A piece of that will be taken and mixed in as if it's something new. We trust root just as much as we trust intrap latencies or the randomization instruction. Because once again, he can't control, you can't control what's really going on there. It's something old, something new. So it's just a mixing function. And of course, at reboot, you're going to go write that out and bring the whole circle around again. Now, there's something else that we discovered quite early on with a randomization subsystem, which we think is very interesting. And this is something that no, other people are not doing. So imagine you just have a random stream inside libc from arc for random. It's just a stream of bytes. Now imagine that you've got different things using that thing off the same stream. So everybody isn't just going and asking the random subsystem to get, to get them something. They actually are using the same stream inside their own function. So I'm just going to go and they're grabbing chunks over here, right? But here's an example of what happens in OpenBSD. Because We've made it so our libc uses the random number generator so much on its own that a, a, a typical application, for example, here's a sample of an application which looks like it's perhaps doing some DNS, and inside the DNS library it's doing a malloc and a free of a temporary buffer or something. It will go and grab snapshots of this random data and mix, and therefore it actually is effectively almost creating something like entropy by stealing chunks out of the, 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 the shared random buffer. See, if it was a s very, very large single buffer in, for each independent consumer, an independent consumer could actually look at that buffer and actually find out, uh, maybe do some sort of a cryptographic prediction or backtracking sort of thing. But you can't do that if you're sharing it with unintended consumers simultaneously. So this is just inside one, one program. So the benefits are that we're effectively gaining backtracking resistance, which is you, can, you can't go look back into the past and figure out why, uh, what, some, what a value might have been at some point in the past. And we're also generating predictive resistance. That's the f forward view of the same problem. We can't really prove this, and we've looked for... Uh, people in, uh, associated with the project to actually go do some research on this and actually do this. But all the PhDs have turned us down, saying the problem is too hard. The, the kernel is doing this as well. It has a single RC4 generator running for the kernel, but it's been used for many activities, and some of these activities are largely asynchronous. So for example, forks happen all the time, and we generate just this is a simple example, we do random PIDs. So that's a small piece of entropy which has to be taken out of the pool. Um, but you can't really go and predict when a process is going to fork. Simultaneous, we're using for the address space randomization mapping addresses. Lots of entropy gets pulled out over there. And for MMAP, we do address space randomization for user land as well. Uh, as well as the kernel. And so there's lots of pieces, snippets of 32-bit of values and 64 values that have to be pulled out of the pool to make those decisions and map things uh, in the right place. We're doing it on a packet creation. So we're randomizing the, the, the PID number, the PID IDs, uh, so, it's, so the, the, uh, the IP packet IDs. 
and uh, we're playing games with sequence numbers as well, putting them at random offsets, and we're actually using some strange crypto over there, which actually wants initial vectors or just like that to do the right thing. Uh, in our packet filter, our NAP is doing things like this. Uh, IP port allocation, the scheduler adds a little bit of random into his decisions. Um, all these things add up, and they're coming out of a single stream, but the requests are asynchronous with respect to each other. So that you've got, you're building up resistance pa patterns on top of a layer which has no, almost no locking in it and runs a very, very free form. So I would argue that these extractions actually create almost as much strength as, as actually throwing entropy into the top of the pool. In user land, the primary perturber in OpenBSD is our malloc layer, because we are doing not just MMAP-based address space randomization. We're also doing it inside our malloc layer, not just for large objects like pages, but even for smaller objects. And these decisions are made not just at malloc time, but also at free time. Uh, Typically, your malloc layer also tries to keep some objects in the address space live for recycling, so that you don't, you're not pushing everything to and from the kernel continually. Um, so we actually even make random decisions at free as to which order to reuse those objects later on. We've got buckets that are randomly ordered. And this also this helps find bugs in software, of course. It helps act as a mitigation te technique. But look what else is doing. These are acting as a semi-asynchronous perturbances uh, against your pool. Uh, and the reason why they are asynchronous is because much software which is attackable in the net is actually sitting on a socket. And on a socket, you don't always get your full payloads. You could get short payloads, you get timing intervals between those, th those things. Th these create perturbances on these pools, uh, on the single stream, for when the extractions happen. So, I, I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool because we're getting this benefit without actually adding any more locking and actually making it expensive. It's really cheap. Uh, user land also has to go and reseed once in a while. Well, actually, it doesn't have to. There's arguments happening now, especially from Dan Bernstein, that we don't actually have to ever reseed as long as we know we've set up very well at the start. We still have reseeding code. Uh, we may delete it later on, but we still have it for now. So basically, the, essentially, we uh, reseed when too much volume of data has been used, so many bytes, uh, when too much time has gone, or when we detect a fork. When a fork in processes happen, um, there's been concerns recently over um, creating, a, like, a backtracking or forward predictive sort of behaviors between two processes. If one of the processes get captured, it can predict what's happening in the other process. So therefore, the fork logic, the fork detection logic was improved uh, recently. Um, but a warning here is that it's still broken in some other operating systems that have older versions of our code base. Uh, for example, uh, uh, it. Well, it's definitely broken in FreeBSD, but that's, that's a given. Um, we've been telling them for a year. <laughs> they keep finding reasons not to fix it. it I, think, I, think, I, think it's still I think it's broken in Mac OS. So this is the recent work which happened, is to make the reseeding reliable. Uh, the boot block stuff, this is what I described earlier. And we've been working on portabilities to other subsystems because of Libra SSL. Remember back earlier on, I said that we don't care about the cipher? We actually do care about the cipher. It just wasn't the, major, the primary issue. So we eventually did change it just recently to cha-cha. So it's faster. It's a more modern algorithm. The, 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 um, the, the, it, it has some stronger guarantees in it. Um, and uh, a workaround which we had for RC4, where we, were to, where we had to throw away the initial part of the stream uh, due to a weakness in RC4 uh, has been eliminated. Um, oh yeah, and it's faster. So arc for random is probably, I think some measurements I saw is that it's one seventh the speed of B0. That's pretty good random, that's pretty fast. But we haven't changed the name of the function. And actually did quite a bit of wordsmithing to come out with this particular um, chunk in the manual page, um, just to make it quite clear. So it's now a replacement call for random. 
Uh, the thing is, now there's too many versions of it. It's too spread out. It's, it, it's, it's everywhere. I mean, uh, Arc for Random is in all of the API spaces that people use for writing apps on, on iPhones and everything else like that. That's the function they're calling. So at this point, the name is probably set in stone. Uh, but we didn't know what to do initially. Like, we had to come up with a name. So somehow we ended up locking it into a particular cryptographic function. Um, and I look back at, back at it, and I think we should have actually just called it good random. The thing is, you don't want to make too many promises. So you don't want to call it great random, or excellent random, or best random, or guaranteed random. But good, good's a good word. But um, there's also another effort simultaneously to try to call POSIX random. This is a bit of a joke, but it's probably the only way we're going to actually get this into something, into some of the other operating systems. So. So our goals have been satisfied. It's available in, in all of our coding environments um, that's o that are OpenBSD related. And there's no stigma for any developer working in our group from using it. In fact, there's no stigma anymore from a developer who's writing portable code to not use it either. For example, just recently, NSD and Unbound, the, the, the new DNS daemons, they're using it as well. So, um, it, it, it's fairly easy. You start explaining to them the, how much hard work they're doing at actually doing random and creating their own random layer, and they say, this is the right API. This is what I wish I had in other systems. And so they actually start writing wrappers. They start writing their own arc for random stubs to try to get the same semantic, because this is the semantic they want. Inside our tree, we've got about 1,000 calls um, in our user land, and we've got about 100, 100 calls in our kernel. Um, and of course, all the ones in user land over there percolate up. They create effects. So if a libc function inside DNS does this, that of course affects any DNS call made by any application you run. The effects in the malloc are same, an RPC, all sorts of things. Just bit by bit, these things all abstract their way up to create additional benefits. And some risk, of course. So for example, when we went to random PIDs at our kernel, there were high-level applications that broke because they expect it to be the next PID. It sounds ridiculous, but this type of code has, was always out there. So when you, when you shake things up at the bottom, something falls out of the tree over there. Other platforms have picked this thing up. The most prolific one is probably that Android uses this everywhere throughout its entire ecosystem. But they did rename it. It's got a, it's got a different name. But the behaviors are all the same and uh, they share quite a bit of the code from us. It's in Blackberries, it's in Mac OS, it's in all the BSDs. Uh, by saying Mac OS, that means it's in iOS as well. So basically, I just told you it's in all the phones, in all their libc's, and it gets percolated up into their, their programming interfaces. Um, many applications out in the portable space uh, will use Arc for Random if it's available. They have an have Arc for Random, and then they use it instead of some other subsystem. And many libraries actually even have their own versions of it as well. Like, they've decided that this is the interface they prefer to program their code to. And below that layer, if they don't have Arc for Random, they try to create their own based on what the system has. And then finally, of course, LibreSSL now has it. So if you have LibreSSL on a system, you get Arc for Random for free. We've just thrown it in there. Um, nobody's noticed. There's been no outrage either. So, and I mean, th I think the, the only major outrage could be, what if there's a different art for random that behaves differently? But this API is so dead simple, it's going to be exactly the same. We're not worried there. And the gorilla in the room. So what's happening with Linux? Well, Linux now has a get random system call kind of designed based on our get entropy system call, which we feed into feed data up to Arc for Random with. But it has too many options and is difficult to, to use. Um, if you try to get a buffer of over 256 bytes out of it, it has interrupt handler issues. Interrupts could, hand, could, could arrive. So the amount of code you have to write around it to use it safely is, is, is pretty nasty. And we really hope that applications start, don't start calling this directly. But we've already seen patches being submitted on mailing lists for this. We've got some people trying to explain these issues into the upstream packages to ensure that the risks don't show up here. Um, 
and the risks are pretty grave. An example of a risk is um, that you've got a, a software package which has intrap handlers in it, and uh, get random gets called with a large buffer, but you've got the wrong flags set, and intrap handler arrives, and now your random buffer is all zeros. Because the intrap handler arrived, and the system call didn't retry, because get ra get ran the ra Linux get random system call is actually a read system call, kind of, behind the scenes. So anybody wants to talk about that and have a laugh, if it's really technical conversation, but oh, I'll have a, I'll have a big laugh. So it's a, it's a bit worrying that as soon as you try to do something, like we try to do something right with art for random, it's a bit worrying. It seems like there's back pressure, back pressure from some, coming from somewhere, that this type of thing should not be ubiquitous. If random becomes too easy, there's people, this just seems to be people who don't want this. And so this use slash dev random meme keeps on being out there. And I, I get it, it's the only interface Linux has, and so everybody keeps using it, but how, that, that's the problem that needs to be fixed. So, and I'll just close with a slide to show it's kind of popular. So what's interesting over here is the first one is, is it's, it's on iPhones. The second one is on developer.apple. <laughs> uh, so it's pretty common function to use out there. Okay, okay, that's it. Okay, are there any questions? <laughs> no, that's Are there any questions? No, thank you.